his wife, they were driving down through East Texas, and they come through this little tiny town. You might have actually driven through. That's probably not that far from where you grew up. Anuak. Oh, yeah. And if you've ever driven through Anuak, it, the name is spelled some sort of weird, funny way. I mean, it don't look like Anuak. It looks like Anahuac or, or something, you know. And there's been all sorts of controversy about how to say, well, this husband and his wife, they were driving, and they saw the sign, and 50 miles out, it said Anuak, 50 miles. And, and they got into a discussion on how to say the name of the town. And the husband said it was one way, and the wife said it was another way. And 20 miles later, they saw another side, 30 miles to end like And again, the discussion ensued, and they began to fight and bicker and argue about this is how you say it. No, this is how you say it. Well, the husband, by the time they reached the city limits, he saw the city limit sign. He had had enough of his bickering wife. And so they saw a fast food restaurant. He said, we're going to settle this once and for all. And so they pulled in that fast food restaurant. The man had his wife by the arm, and he's dragging her in the door. They get up to the front cash register, and the little lady goes, Hello, sir, can I help you? He says, look, we don't need no burgers. We don't need no fries. We don't want no onion rings, and we certainly don't want an apple pie. I need for you right here and right now to very plainly, clearly, and slowly tell my wife what the name of this place is, because we've been arguing about it for 20 minutes. So tell me, tell her very slowly, enunciate, where are we? The lady looked at first a little startled, leaned in on the counter, and said, Burger King. <laughs> <laughs> I even made her upset over there with my short show. Yeah. All right, turn with me if you would in your Bible this morning. Mm -hmm. Anawak. <laughs> oh, Lord. Turn with me if you would in your Bible this morning to, the, to two places, 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, and Matthew, the fifth chapter. 2 Corinthians 5. And Matthew 5, as today we talk about reconciliation. Reconciliation means to reestablish the relationship. That's what the word means. I'm going to reestablish a relationship. Look with me starting in verse uh, 17 of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has, begun a, has become a new person. The old life is gone, and a new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us the task of reconciling people to himself. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin, that we could be made right with God through Christ. Now turn over with me to Matthew, the fifth chapter. Matthew 5, verse 23 and 24. So, if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. Now, in just a moment, we're going to jump over to the Old Testament, and we're going to look at two stories of reconciliation, of, or that are often cited as stories of reconciliation. But I think it's very important for us as Christians, we take our basis from the New Testament. The Old Testament has types and shadows. It's a teacher to us. We can look and we can learn various things from that. The New Testament tells us what to do with it. Right. Okay? So the first thing that we see in the passage in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, is that the entirety of the message of the gospel is about reconciling relationship. The whole thing, from start to finish, is about how God, through 
Jesus Hallelujah. came to reconcile us to himself. Amen. If you remember the account, and we read it a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about marriage, when God used to meet with Adam and Eve and meet, walk with them in the cool of the garden, God created man in order to have a relationship. That was the purpose. God did not desire a relationship with the gorillas or the kangaroos or the giraffes. He desired a relationship with mankind. And God said, there is only one thing that I ask for you to do. Only one thing that I ask. It was called the Adamic Covenant. It said, as long as you obey me, you and I will be in relationship. As long as you obey me. And remember that God created Adam without sin. However, he was created with a free will to do as he desired. That God was not going to force Adam or Eve to do anything that was against their wishes. And so God gave them several rules, but one of them was in the midst of the garden, he set a tree. And that was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We often hear it's an apple tree. It doesn't matter what kind of tree it was. He said, of this tree, you can eat of any tree in the whole garden. You can have anything you want, but this one tree, don't eat from it. For in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Of course, we know the story. The slithering serpent came and said, you're not really going to die if you eat that. Look how yummy it looks. Looks good. And so they partook. And in their rebellion to God, their relationship with God was broken. Remember, the covenant was based on obedience. Mm -hmm. And when they disobeyed, the covenant was broken and relationship was severed. And God came down to the garden to walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. And they hid themselves from God, recognizing the relationship was broken. It was in Genesis, the second chapter, in the 15th verse, that we come to the first promise that a Messiah would one day come. One day, God would send a Redeemer who would reconcile man to himself. Fast forward 4,000 years, and God sent Jesus, born of a virgin, in a tiny little stable, laid in a manger, lived a sinless life, performed attesting miracles, stood before Pontius Pilate without sin, never raised his word, and yet unjustly condemned, died a criminal's death. And with that precious blood, he reconciled man back to God and provided a way for us to come back to him. What a beautiful picture that is. And we're going to kind of dive into that. But that's what we see there in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. And God says now that you have been reconciled to God. You are now charged with telling others to be reconciled to God. As though God is in you begging. I don't know if you caught that. That the God of the universe is res- is is humbling himself down to begging men to be reconciled to God. What a powerful picture. Then in Matthew, the fifth chapter, those are red letters last time I checked, which means Jesus spoke them. For some people, they think they're more important, but I say the whole Bible is red letters. It is the word of God. Jesus spoke every word of it. However, Jesus is speaking. He says, now you're in the temple. You've come and you've come to worship. And suddenly you remember that someone has something against you. Jesus said, leave your gift at the altar. Go and be reconciled with them. Then come back and worship. You see, many times in church, you'll hear pastors and preachers and ministers say, oh, worshiping God is the most important thing. You need to worship God. You need to work. Come on, let's lift up hands. Let's sing. Let's dance. Let's clap. Let's do this. Let's worship. And I'm going to tell you right now that if in the middle of your worship time, you realize that there is something in your heart against someone or someone has something against you, God says, stop worshiping and go make it right. Right. 
Yeah. The Apostle John in 1 John says, How can you even attempt to love God who you have not seen? If you don't yeah. love your brother and your yeah. sister who you can see, you make out God to be a liar when you do that. Oh, I'm telling you, I'm not even going to reconcile this by the time I finish. In the Old Testament, we have two stories which are often cited when we talk about reconciliation. And I want to offer to you today that one of them is not reconciliation at all. It is a false alternative. And one of them really is. Today I want us to look at the story of Jacob and Esau and the story of Joseph and his brothers. And I'll let you determine which one is reconciliation and which one is not. You might think you might have your ideas now. As a quick recap on the story of Jacob and Esau, a beautiful story, although it starts out rather rough. Jacob, of course, who later would have his name changed to be Israel. Jacob's name, by the way, means cheater. <laughs> cheater and swindler, what a great name to have your mama calling. Hey, cheater, come here, boy. You look so cute today. Hey, cheater. <laughs> hey, liar, swindler. Good Lord, have mercy. No wonder the guy ended up cheating and swindling so many people. <laughs> anyway, we have the story of Jacob and Esau. Esau was the firstborn, and Jacob was born just a few minutes after him. And back in in the, in the biblical days, the order of the birth was critically important because it determined upon whom the blessing of the Father would come and who would inherit what the Father had. I know it doesn't seem fair to us in our Western way of thinking, but it's how they did things. And so the Bible says that one day while Esau was out in the field, he was... Oh, famished, and Jacob made him a nice little pot of stew, and Esau sold his birthright and cheated, uh, and, and got cheated out of his birthright. Basically, he got swindled by Jacob out of his blessing. And Jacob, the Bible says, as soon as it happened, got the heck out of Dodge, because he knew that once Esau realized what he had done, that it was going to be off with Jacob's neck. And so the Bible says that Jacob fled and ran for 20 years. 20 years goes by, and in the 20 ensuing years, we have the account of Jacob marrying Laban's daughters, Rachel and Leah. And again, he ends up running away from from Laban and there was some cheating and swindling that happened there and there was some more cheating and swindling that happened down the road and one day he realized you know at some point I'm going to have to go back to the land where I came from because that's what I've inherited but we got a problem and the problem is my brother's there that's where my brother lives and if Esau ever gets hold of me what's he going to do to me he going to kill me and so, in the, in the 30, uh, starting in about the 31st chapter all the way through the 33rd chapter of the book of Genesis, we see the account as, as Jacob sends a party on ahead <coughs> to see how Esau would feel about him coming back home. And so, Jacob gets a, oh, he gets a bunch of goodies pulled together, a bunch of livestock and a bunch of money and everything. And he sends it on ahead, and he says, uh, he sends the servant, and the servant goes to Esau and says, Esau, uh, your brother Jacob would like to come back home, and he's giving you all this. He comes back to, he comes back to Jacob, and he says, well, Jacob, I, I, I sent him your gifts, and I gave him your message. Well, how did it turn out? Well, Esau's got about an army of about 400 guys, and they're heading your way right about now. That didn't look very good. And so he devised a scheme that he was going to take his families, put it in two, send half of them this way, half of them that way. And yet again, he took even more gifts and more stuff to send on ahead to meet Esau on the way. And so it was like 200 sheep, goat, and 20 ram, 50 bulls, and 500 cows, and I mean all these camels and money and everything. And he would think, man, this sounds really good. Man, Jacob's learned his lesson. He's really eaten his humble pie here, isn't he? 
He's he's trying to he's trying to get things made right with Esau. But if you look at the 20th verse of the 32nd chapter of Genesis, would you pull that up for me, honey? Because you can probably do that faster than I can turn there. Genesis 32, 20. Now you'll see the real reason why he did that. And be sure to say, look, your servant Jacob is right behind us. Jacob thought, I will try to appease him by sending gifts ahead of me. When I see him in person, perhaps he will be friendly to me. You're like, well, pastor, what's so wrong with that? He wasn't trying to reconcile with him. He was trying to bribe him. He was trying to buy peace. He was trying to say, well, I'm going to be really, 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 really nice to you. I'm not really sorry for what I did. Right now. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a bunch of stuff. Kind of second best. I know you didn't get the inheritance. And you're not going to get everything that I got. But here, I'll give you something. Right. The Bible says in the 33rd chapter, starting with verse 1, Then Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming with his 400 men. So he divided his children among Leah and Rachel and his servants' wives. He put the servant wives with their children in at the front, Leah and the children next, and Rachel and Joseph last. Then Jacob went on ahead. As he approached his brother, he bowed to the ground seven times before him. And one of the most beautiful verses in all of the Old Testament comes next. Then Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they both wept. Then Esau looked at the women and the children and asked, Who are these people with you? These are the children God has graciously given me, your servant, Jacob replied. The ser- then the servants' wives came forward and their children, and they bowed. And next came Leah with her children, and they bowed. And finally Joseph and Rachel came forward, and they bowed. And, and what were all the flocks and the herds that I met before I came? Jacob replied, These are a gift, my lord, to ensure your friendship. My brother, I have plenty, Esau answered. Keep what you have for yourself. But Jacob insisted, No, if I have found favor with you, please accept this gift from me. And what a relief to see your friendly face. It is like seeing the face of God. Please take this gift I have brought you, for God has been very gracious to me. I have more than enough. And because Jacob insisted, Esau finally accepted the gift. Well, Esau said, let's be going. I will lead the way. But Jacob replied, you can see, my Lord, that some of the children are very young, and the flocks and the herds have their young too. If they're driven too hard, even for one day, all the animals could die. Please, my Lord, go ahead of your servant. We will follow slowly at a pace that is more comfortable for the livestock and the children. I will meet you at Seir. All right, Esau said, but at least let me assign some of my men to guide and protect you. Jacob responded, no, it's not necessary. It's enough that you have received me warmly, my Lord. So Esau turned around and started back to Seir that same day. Jacob, on the other hand, traveled to Sukkoth. There he built himself a house and made shelters for his livestock. That is why the place was named Sukkoth, which means shelters. I often read this story and thought, oh, how sweet. Look at there. Jacob and Esau were reconciled and all was good. But actually, after you read this account, Jacob and Esau never meet again until the death of their father. And that was the only time they met. There was not reconciliation there. As a matter of fact, you can read further down into the story, and you can really, understanding the customs of the day, you really begin to understand. Esau calls Jacob brother numerous times. Did you notice that? My brother, I'm so happy. My brother, my brother. And what does Jacob call Esau instead? My Lord. My Lord. My Lord. There was not a desire to restore the relationship that had been there previously. It was... I just came in order to save my neck. I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing this for me. Oh, boy. Jacob lies yet again. Did you notice that? Go ahead and go back to Seir. I'll meet you there. And then never shows up. I wonder how long. I wonder how long 
His brother sat there waiting. Jeez. Well, is he going to come today? Jeez. Oh, maybe he's just delayed. He's got the, his livestock and his kids. and mm. Mm. They kiss, but they do not share a meal together. Now, that was in the Near Eastern culture, even to this day, the way of symbolizing relationship, the sharing of a meal. There is no greater compliment that you can get in Arab and Jewish society than for them to invite you into their home and for them to join a meal. That is why the Pharisees got so upset with Jesus because he would sit and he would dine with sinners. Jesus was saying, I have a relationship with them, but I don't with you. Amen. Oh, boy. Hallelujah. That's good, Pastor. Yeah. There's a couple of things that we can learn from the story of Jacob and Esau when we're speaking about trying a relationship that's broken. And clearly the relationship between Jacob and Esau was as broke as broke could be. When you have these things, there's some things that we can learn. I remember I mentioned it when we first, when y'all installed me as the pastor and I was talking about some folks and I said, there's some folks that I can give thanks to because I learned from them what not to do. And from this, we can learn there are some things in an effort to try to get reconciliation that you don't need to do. First, realize that in spite of your best efforts, reconciliation may not occur. And that's okay. It's all right. You see, there was a point you can tell that, the, uh, that, that it was... It was more so Esau who was excited to see his brother because once and for all the relationship would be settled. And when, when he tries to bribe him and give him all this stuff, Esau says, you don't gotta do that. God's been good to me. I mean, I made some bad choices along the way and I've, yeah, I've gotten some consequences, but God in his grace has blessed me and I, I've got more than enough. I don't need your sheep and your goats and your animals and all this. I don't need that. Esau wanted reconciliation. Esau wanted the relationship back with his brother, but he didn't get it. And you notice that Esau did not sit there and continue to try to pursue after and pursue after and pursue after trying to reconcile, but he left the door open. He said, he said, hey, why don't you come with me? No, that's okay. You know, I got the young animals and I got my kids and I don't want to push them too hard. Okay, well, how about I get some guys? This is a very dangerous area, and the land was known for people who would be highway robbers. They would kill, and they would rob these people of everything. Here, let me provide my men, these 300 that came with me. I brought them in order to give you safe passage through the land that I know. They're well-respected. Go with them. No harm will come to you. And Jacob said, that's okay. You see, every effort that Esau was making at reconciliation, Jacob was slapping away and saying, yeah, no, it, right. it's okay. I got what I came for. Yeah. Right. I got what I came for. I came for you being okay with me coming back over here. I'm good. That's all right. And many times I see people who have been in relationships that have broken apart, whether it be marriages or they've been dating or friendships, and one wants to reconcile the other, doesn't. All the other one wants is, you know what, I just want to kind of be in a friendly truth with you, and that's about it. And the biggest mistake you can do at that point is keep running after them. But please, but please, but please, but please, oh please, oh please. You don't read of Esau running back over to Jacob's door every day going, sending him 20,000 text messages. Send a friend request on Facebook every single day. Say oh, that. please be my friend. You see, Esau didn't have an affirmation addiction. Esau wanted reconciliation more so for Esau than for himself. He was content. He said, I have plenty. I have all that I need. I'm good. I, I want to be back in relationship with you because we're bound together. Oh, let me move on. Good. But he left the door open, and I will tell you that's something that you learn. That when people knock down your efforts to rebuild a relationship, don't get spiteful and angry and mean and vengeful as a result of it. Say, you know what? My door's open. Leave it open. Don't sit there and stew on it and sit there like, oh, I wonder if they're going to show up. I'm sure that if, he, if Jacob had shown up at Esau's house, three years later, Esau would have said, well, it's nice to see you. 
and it would have gone on just like it had before. But it never happened that way. Right. God offers us reconciliation. He puts no conditions on it. Right. He doesn't say that if you really, if you do, if you follow these 15 steps, that I'm going to consider reconciling you. Now, I know the church has told us that, right? Right. But, but if you keep the Ten Commandments, and if you take communion, you show up to church, you pay your tithes, you do this, you do that, you don't go bowling, you don't do a mixed bacon, oh, oh. you don't cut your hair a certain way, the late women don't wear no makeup, whatever. You, Whatever faith tradition you grew up in, you all had rules, I know you did. You don't listen to rock and roll music, whatever that was. Your church tries to put conditions on God's grace, and there is no condition. And there should be no condition upon your extending grace to someone else. If they're willing to be reconciled to you, and if they're willing to accept your offer of forgiveness, forgive and move on. Oh, let's go on. He didn't try to force the issue. When Jacob refused, Esau went about his business. When you didn't know the Lord, it wasn't as though the Lord kept hounding you and chasing you down. Right. Yeah. Now, he made sure that every now and then you would hear the message, but it wasn't like God stopped the affairs of managing the universe in order to come and knock on your door and stand there knocking on your door. Yeah. Oh, I hope they'll answer the door today. I hope they'll answer the door today. I hope, yeah, oh, I wish they would answer the door today. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus goes on with his affairs. Go on with yours. All right. Right. Esau went on with his. Go on with yours. An offer of forgiveness is not based on the other party's willingness to accept the offer. You see, many times, and I had someone, had someone uh, email me and said, after I ministered the sermon about uh, going and dealing with someone and, and asking them, you know, to the message on uh, conflict in the church where you go first with one and then with two and then bring it before the church. So, but what if they won't listen to you? What if they don't want to be reconciled to you? What do I do then? My friend, you still forgive. <laughs> Forgiveness on your part doesn't hinge upon their willingness to accept it or not. Right. Your extending forgiveness is for your benefit. Right. It benefits you to say, you know what? I am no longer going to harbor ill and malice in my heart. I'm not going to be bitter and ugly towards somebody because of something that happened. They may never make it right with me, but I love them. And that is the picture that we see in the book of 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. From that very first text I read to you, God was in Jesus pleading with men, be reconciled. You see, when people say, oh, God, forgive me, God, forgive me, God, forgive me, he's already forgiven them. We don't have to beg for forgiveness. The forgiveness has been given. We simply have to accept it. That's it. In order to to enjoy the blessings that come from his forgiveness, we must accept it. But he has already forgiven. The thief that was on the cross, he was forgiven. The other one was not. Why? They were both forgiven, but one accepted it, one did not. One experienced the blessings. This day you shall be with me in paradise. Jesus did not harbor ill and unforgiveness towards those who crucified him. Remember what he prayed. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And my friend, if you're going to be successful in the Christian walk, realize ahead of time that your, all your efforts at trying to reconcile and make peace with people may not work. But that shouldn't mean you don't forgive. Your forgiveness is settled and done. You get offer forgiveness to all. Hold malice towards none. And hopefully they will accept it. Romans 5, 8 is a beautiful picture, and that is that while we were his enemies, ah. Jesus died for us. Yes. Amen. What are you willing to do for your enemy? Oh, Amen. Let's go on. When forgiveness and reconciliation is offered, it must be accepted. Just because it's offered doesn't mean it's appreciated. Mm -hmm. There is an idea out there called universalism. Which says that all men are saved, period, because God's already forgiven them. My friend, forgiveness must still be accepted. Amen. If I put a thousand dollars down here on this on this altar and I say, Jerry, that's your thousand dollars, Jerry can run out that back door and say, I got a thousand dollars, I got a thousand dollars, woo! -hoo! 
I got a thousand dollars. He can go down to Kroger, fill up his basket, but if he gets up to the checkout line, he doesn't have his thousand dollars. All right. He's gonna leave empty-handed. Yeah. You better accept it. Yeah. All right. This is not a message on universalism, so we'll move on. <laughs> that was a freebie. Sad to say, I don't believe that the story of Jacob and Esau is reconciliation at all. It is a cheap counterfeit, and there are plenty out there who will offer you a cheap counterfeit. And yet people will continue to pursue that cheap counterfeit time and time again. My friend, if it's counterfeit, don't go running after it. Right. You've forgiven? Good. Move on. All right. Move on. You're good with God. Everything is settled. You're fine. Now let's take a look at real reconciliation. And what I believe is the most beautiful story outside of the life of Jesus, the story of Joseph. Amen. There is none other that I... It, I have... There's been a few times I've, as I've thought about the life of Joseph that I've kind of almost been moved to tears and had my mascara run. <laughs> you see, we know the story. Joseph was... We read about it just a few minutes ago. The youngest son of Jacob, All right. the one that Jacob loved the most. All right. Jacob had 12 sons. Joseph was the youngest. Joseph shouldn't be getting any sort of a special treatment. He was the last in line for the blessing. And one day we know the story that Joseph had a dream. And that dream in it, all his brothers were going to be bowing down before him. And his daddy had made for him that famous coat of many colors, which signified authority. His brothers becoming jealous of, J of Joseph, who had done no ill and had done no wrong to them, captured him, tied him up, and threw him in the bottom of a pit and had been intent to leave him there to die. Because they wanted to be rid of this little pest who was challenging their rightful place with the birthright. And so one of them to say, no, let's not just leave them there to die. Let's make a little money off them. And so as some Egyptians came by, they sold Joseph into slavery and said, well, we're done with him. Joseph ended up in the house of a man named Potiphar. And there, because of his faithful service, rose to become the chief of all the slaves in the house. Now, I don't know if that's a great honor or not, because you're still a slave at the end of the day. But nonetheless, he had a place of authority in the house, and apparently, according to what we can read in the Old Testament, he was something to look at. He was good looking, and Mrs. Potiphar saw this young, strapping Jewish lad standing there, and she just thought, hmm, look at that. Mm -mm -mm -mm. He got you going on. She made goo-goo eyes for him. She chased him and said, come over here, and let's have some fun, baby, baby, baby. And he said, I can't commit this ill sin with you. You are married. He ran. She chased after him. She grabbed him by his by his uh, tunic or whatever. He kept running right out of his clothes. Miss Potiphar was so mad that she'd been rejected. She falsely accused Joseph of having attempted to rape her and showed his clothes and as proof of the fact, look, look, I got his clothes. He left his clothes here. I fought him off. Throw in prison. And then, even as opportunities presented themselves for him to get his freedom, he was lied to and forgotten. All right. And the Reader's Digest abridged version, we fast forward, and through a set of circumstances so miraculous, he ends up in the house of Pharaoh, delivered from the prison, and is now the second in charge in the most powerful nation on the world, the prime minister, if you will, under Pharaoh. A beautiful story. And God had given him a dream that there would be three years of plenty, and there would be three years of famine, and that they needed to store up all the grain. And they did, and they were prepared for the famine. And when the famine hit, it didn't only hit Egypt, but it hit the land where his brothers and his daddy were. But his brothers and his daddy heard that there was grain in Egypt. And so they came, and they begged before Joseph, Oh, give us some grain lest we die. They did not recognize Joseph, but he recognized them. 
You see, when you've been wrong like that, it's pretty easy to remember the faces of those who hurt you that way. They'd forgotten all about him, left him as a thought in the bywinds of history. I don't need him no more. He's gone. Good. But Joseph, I'm sure, had plenty of time to think about all the ill that had befallen him. Joseph's life of any talks about how unfair life can be. He hadn't done anything to deserve any of the things he got. And yet here he was, sitting in a dungeon, falsely accused, and finally now elevated to this place. And through a set of circumstances, he sent them back twice. They come back with their youngest brother. And Jacob, or Joseph puts them through a few tests. And finally in the in chapter 45, starting with verse 1, just 10 chapters after our last story, we read the account where the reconciliation takes place. And I'm going to hurry as we conclude here this morning. 45 verse 1, Joseph could stand it no longer. In the room, and he said to his attendants, out, all of you. And so he was alone with his brothers when he told them who he was. And he broke down and he wept. He wept so loudly the Egyptians could hear him, and the word of it was carried throughout Pharaoh's palace. I am Joseph, he said to his brothers. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was standing in front of them. Please come closer, he said. So they came closer, and he said again, I'm Joseph, your brother, who you sold into slavery in Egypt. But don't be upset, and don't be angry with yourself for sending me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. This famine that has ravaged the land for two years will last five more, and there will neither be plowing nor harvesting. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve the many survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. And he was the one who made me an advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of his entire palace, and the governor of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and tell him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me master over all of the land of Egypt, so come down to me immediately. You can live in the land of Goshen, where you can be near me with all your children with the, all your children and grandchildren, your flocks and your herds and everything you own, I will take care of you there, for there are still five years of famine ahead of us. Otherwise, you and your household, all your animals will starve. Then Joseph added, look, you can see for yourself, so you can carry my brother Benjamin, that I really am Joseph. Go, tell my father of my honored position here. Describe him everything you have seen, and bring my father here quickly. Weeping with joy. He embraced Benjamin, and Benjamin did the same. Then Joseph kissed each of his brothers and wept over them. And after that, they began talking freely with him. What a powerful story. If anyone had a reason to be vengeful, bitter, to exact revenge, it was Joseph. Here stood the people who had put his life through so much pain and misery. And he had the power in his hands. He held power over them for life. And death. With one word, he could have had every one of them killed. But he did not. He checked their motives. In the chapters preceding what we just read, he checked their motives to see what it was that they did. And they came clean and they went bitterly before him and said, We did this to our father. Please don't take Benjamin from us. Don't. And you see, he could see, he could found that they were in a place where they were repentant, where they knew that what they had done was wrong. He checked their motives, not in a spiteful way, but instead to bring them face to face with what they did so that they could repent. It is not God's plan for you to continue to live in pain and abuse. You see, had they not done that, I don't think that this story would have turned out this way. Had they not come to the point where they were willing to confront their past and to repent, I believe that Joseph would have done them no harm, but he would have sent them away and there would have been no reconciliation. But instead, they came to a place where they admitted what they did. And therefore, they were reconciled. Once he knew their motives and of their genuine repentance, then he extended the olive branch. Forgiveness had been granted to them before they did that, though. 
Otherwise, he'd have him killed when he first saw them. He recognized them the moment they set foot in the palace. He could have had them killed and he would have been perfectly right to do so. But he didn't. Forgiveness had already been extended. Their knowledge of the forgiveness that was not revealed to them until they were at a place of forgiveness, at a place of repentance. Though it was he who had been hurt, he extends the olive branch. Let me tell you, someone's got to make the first move. Someone has to. And if you've got a relationship that's all broken, that's been messed up, and if you're desiring reconciliation, then if you've heard God's voice, it is to you to make the first move. Now, if they will not repent, you still extend forgiveness, but you don't tie yourself back together and knit yourself back together with that. God does not expect you to live in that sort of a thing. Once forgiven, it was never brought up again. We never read about Joseph telling his brothers, you're under the spotlight now. Mm. I have a boss. Well, of course I have a boss. My boss, when he sees something wrong in a store, oh, mercy, he'll go up to that manager and he'll go, I saw what you did. And for the next three months, you are under the spotlight. Every little thing you do wrong, I will point out to you. And I will remind you of this thing that you did. That's a great way to inspire people to do better, isn't it? I don't do that, thankfully. God doesn't do that, and neither should you. Once you have made up your mind to forgive, let it go. If you reconcile with them, you move on as though it never happened. If you don't reconcile with them, you still move on as though it never happened. You just don't be in contact with them. That's what Jesus was saying. Put them aside. Let them go their way. Jesus said, if you come to the altar, and there you remember, leave your gift and go be reconciled. It is a clear command, isn't it? Jesus made it plain. It's his expectation. And remember, He's God. He gets to call the shots. Yeah. Number two, it gives us a clear conscience. It's not only clear expectation, it gives us a clear conscience before God to say, you know what? I don't harbor any ill against any man. I stand with a pure conscience before God and before men. I don't harbor ill. Just as God forgave me, I forgive. Yeah. And number three, it gives us clear access. You see, Jesus, in that, when he was telling them about going first one by one, and then two by two, and then three, and then to the church, the very next verse, he says, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. My friend, if you decide that you're going to harbor bitterness and unforgiveness, I will tell you that you are binding the hands of mercy and grace in your life. He still forgives, but you will not live in that blessing because you have bound that up. But when you loose people from their bondage of the bitterness that you hold against them, God releases his grace to flow through your life and you can live. You can live at that point with clear access to the Father, with no hindrance. And nothing standing in your way. This morning in this room, I believe there are three groups of people. Well, four I've spoken to. For one of y'all, for one group, you're like, Pastor, it's good with me. I don't have anybody that I'm harboring ill to. I don't know of anybody that's harboring ill to me. Thank you for telling me this. I will remember it, and I want you to make sure you put this on a bookshelf where you're ready to pull it out when you need it, because you will. The day will come. But there are those in this room here today, some who need to receive forgiveness and be reconciled to God. Who God is saying, I want a relationship with you. Won't you come back to me? That's the first group. And this morning, I want to tell you, forgiveness is there for you. Secondly, there is a group of people here forgiving those who have hurt us. Some of you have been hurt, and you need to offer reconciliation. 
You need to be in the place where you say, you know what? I'm at least willing today. I'm at least willing today to extend forgiveness. Whether they reconcile with me or not is irrelevant. I will forgive. Because the only people you hurt by not forgiving is yourself. And finally, the third group of people, people who need to receive forgiveness and for reconcile with others. Maybe you have harmed someone. Maybe it's as a result of your actions that others have been hurt. Then this morning, I want you to know that God charges you with this word to not be a hearer only, but to be a doer. And after you leave this place, to go seek them out and say, not like, not like Jacob, oh, I'm just doing this to get this off my conscience. I'm just doing this so that I'm going to get out from under the gun. No, I need that relationship. I, need, I want to be back in relationship with you. Will you forgive me? Father, in the name of Jesus, today I pray, Lord, in this room. Your word's gone forth. It's been powerful. It's been sharp. And Lord, there are those here today, Lord, Lord, who are under conviction today. Lord, there is a sense of almost guilt, Lord Jesus. And Lord, guilt can have a positive effect of showing us what it is that we need to get rid of. And guilt can have a bad effect of shame us, Lord. We don't want anyone to be shamed. Thanks for taking the time to watch this video of one of our services at Gateway of Hope Church. We hope it has blessed you, and if it has, we'd love to hear from you. You can contact us on our website at gatewayhouston.org, or contact us on Facebook at facebook.com slash gatewayhouston. You can also, of course, come and tell us in person. We'd love to meet you. Our services are 945 for Sunday School on Sunday mornings. 11 a.m. worship celebration and 7.30 Wednesday evenings for midweek encounter. More information about our services as well as directions to our worship center can be found at gatewayhouston.org. God bless you. See you soon.